All right, let's uh, start with. Where is that mic? Keep that mic off so that we don't have this. Okay, so we are here. Is this too big? Is it okay? Um, so I've done a lot of rearrangement of your notes, so you'll find it very easy to follow now. This is in your outline notes, which is available to you. So these, uh, everything, a topic, all the big topics are put in the center, every little issue that we are covering. So when you're covering, uh, there's a little bit of this notes here, project, like a question question that I gave you, project IRR versus bond I ITM, that's all there. But otherwise, the topics are all here. When you're preparing for your exam, you should be covering them every day, actually, because you'll find it difficult to do your project otherwise, if you wait till the end of the course. So um, all the stuff that is here, I've done a lot of rearrangement. Okay, so so we'll start today we will continue with the uh, option Greeks remember we started the discussion of option Greeks okay so you have to get familiar so there's a little bit of mugging el uh, element involved in this you could say that with this there with everything pretty much that you learn all right that uh, you have to know that Delta refers to the uh, impact of changes 1% change in the underlying price what will be the impact on the model output so if you change one of the inputs so now that we are familiar with model terminology we know what the inputs are and the output is okay so if you do a 1% change in the uh, underlying price what will be the change in the option price so the Delta gives you that okay and the gamma gives you this gamma and Delta are related okay so this is like a second order kind of measure which gives you the rate of change of Delta which will not be directly relevant for you in your project trading but you have to be aware of this these basic concepts of options you should be all clear about okay these are all basic things we are the new stuff that you're learning in addition to FM1 and FM you didn't do all this in FM1 and FM2 right so so this is the new topic that you're covering option sensitivity so you should have an understanding of that that's why that you see when we look at any kind of option software when we look at uh, option software most of them I think it is not reloaded I don't know why it seems to be it was just showing me um, data in my room and it's not there right now but anyway whenever you look at any option software it will give you all these uh, elements okay Delta Gamma Vega Theta these are more important ones these measures are always provided okay because uh, this is what option traders look at okay so for your for your purposes when we go in you'll be mainly concerned with Vega and Theta but Delta and Gamma are also important so we have to be aware of these uh, topics okay these these uh, definitions okay so Delta and Gamma will refer to the underlying price as the input and what is the sensitivity to the option of the output the model output to changes in this 1% change in this and the Gamma gives you the rate of change of the Delta okay so then the Vega is referring to the ball change okay the sensitivity to the ball input okay so if you change the ball input what will happen to the option price this is showing you the um, uh, this is showing you that sensitivity okay is everyone clear about this these concepts these are just sensitivity analysis this we call them partial derivatives okay and then the theta is just showing you the time decay okay so for each day of uh, decline so this only goes one way you notice that both options both put and call options have negative theta okay so they go uh, both go in the same direction if you buy a put or you buy a call it doesn't matter because every day the call as the time to expiry goes time to expiry will after you buy the option option will only go one way right even if you buy a 180 day option time only goes in one direction so next day is 179 days next day is 178 days and so on and so forth so the number of so the time period of the option is continuously decreasing so that loss of value of the option where because of the loss of uh, you know the, the the reduction in the days till expiration the tenor of the option is always getting shorter okay so obviously as we have seen when we had that discussion with Rajan where if you buy a longer term option the cost of the option Cetris Paribus the cost of the option will be more because you're buying insurance for a longer period remember we had that discussion if you buy car insurance for one year and you buy the same car insurance for three years they're going to charge you more because the period for which the option seller is exposed to risk is longer now so they're going to charge you more so therefore basically longer dated any Cetris Paribus longer dated options will have a higher premium okay and therefore so every time that your option once you buy it the days as the days keep passing and you're holding on to the option it is continuously losing value 
on account of the passage of time all right it could on a net basis be gaining value because of the changes in the other inputs but as i said ceteris paribus you're familiar with this term right from your economics classes so uh, set par we can just call it set par for short so uh, this um, when we are talking about the sensitivities it is understood that we keep the other aspects so it's a set par kind of discussion okay we keep the other inputs constant so uh, this theta obviously therefore has a negative whether you buy a put option or a call option the with each day that it passes that passes after you buy the option the option is going to lose value okay uh, set par all right now the the last one is rho this is not so important but you should be aware of it uh, rho is basically the sensitivity to the interest rate okay because the interest rate is also one of the inputs to the model uh, in the model in the ovm model uh, the in the ovm okay the option valuation model the rho the interest rate is also an input so if you change the interest rate okay what happens to the option price okay here you can see the call option and the put option have different values okay so if you increase the interest rate if we say we just directly increase the interest rate look at the call option value what happens to the call option value it goes up okay and the put option value would have gone down that's why you see that the row is negative for the put option so if you increase the interest rate the put option value goes down this is what the negatives mean okay that obviously time you can't increase because time goes in only one direction that's why both of the, the theta for both calls and puts is negative if you have a long call position or you have a long put position your theta is going to be your position theta will be negative because every day you hold on to it it will keep on losing value all right so this is basically so this you have to be aware of this concept that there are option sensitivities and the sensitivities are nothing but the uh, responsiveness of the it, they, they measure the responsiveness of the model output to changes in the model inputs okay so as you tweak one of the model inputs what happens to the model output that's basically what they're trying to measure so you should remember these names that delta and gamma relate gamma is the rate of change of delta they relate to the changes in the underlying vega relates to the changes in the vol input theta relates to the passage of time which is this one and rho relates to the interest rate okay so this is what you should remember so these are the thing now we'll do a little bit more of a discussion i don't know why the feed is not coming in here uh, that's very strange it says no market data for permissions but it was showing feed uh, it was showing me data even a little earlier okay so the data is not coming through for some reason okay something has happened to this uh, so the data is not coming in okay so we'll, we'll we'll stick with what we have okay um, it's very strange that uh, we are not getting the data so okay. so let's continue with this uh, so what else do we need to know about this so so vega as i said the other day it's also called kappa and lambda so today is the, the 27th we continue here okay so some of the other things that we need to understand is which will be important for your all of it is not important for your project as such gamma we're not so concerned about but you should understand these basic terms okay so when you have a short so this is what we are talking about here okay it's all written down in your notes that a, a short option so this is basically these these uh, sensitivities that they're showing you here these are for the long positions okay if you're long a call or a put you have negative theta okay so these are all for long positions so you can see that you can see that a short a long first look at the long position a long position has long gamma okay a long position has so we're talking about now option positions okay so long option position has long vega as well it has long gap it's long gamma so long vega long gamma and um, uh, th theta a long position has what theta negative theta okay so you're okay with that the way i've written it so short long positive negative positive means benefiting from the passage of time okay so this is what we need to understand this will be quite clear once you look at the signs essentially these are for long positions okay so this thing is assuming a long position okay so therefore the uh, the gamma is positive okay a long position in options has a long has long gamma okay short position will have short gamma vega will be also similarly short or long vega theta is the opposite side so if you're sh if you're long an option you have negative theta if you're short an option you have positive theta right this is clear because if you've sold the option obviously if you look at the if you look at the buy side 
If you look at the buy side, if you bought the option, your theta is negative because of every day you hold on to it, the option is losing value. So who's benefiting from that? The guy who's on the other side of the trade. If you bought something, means somebody had to sell it to you, otherwise how would you buy it? Okay, somebody sold it to you, so there's the option seller or the option writer. Okay, so he's making money. So the short position has positive theta. Okay, and uh, the long position has negative theta. And you can see also the short position has, uh, so if you look at the long positions first, the long position will have long gamma, long vega, and negative, uh, you know, short theta, you can say, negative theta, okay? So usually we say negative theta. On the contrary, a short position will have positive theta, okay? But it will have, it will be short vega and long, and short gamma as well. Okay, so it will be short vega and short gamma as well. What that means is when you are when you have running a short position in options, you are exposed to uh, you know jumps in the you are exposed to any kind of movement in the option price, dramatic movement in the in the underlying price. Sorry, in the underlying price as well as the balls. Okay, after you have sold the option, just think about it. After you sold the option, if say the the eyeballs initially were uh, say 25. Okay, after you have sold the option, let's say the balls jump to let's say 16 okay so what happens to the option price if you sold a call option it has jumped dramatically right you sold it at 322 but because the market's estimate of the ball went up okay after you sold it now you are sitting on a big loss so this is what it means to be short theta uh, short vega okay because you have sold the option now you are essentially betting that both the balls and the underlying will basically just collapse okay underlying movement will also collapse the gamma part is a little more difficult to understand essentially gamma gets affected by uh, so is this clear that you are short vega if you are a short option position you are short vega okay if you are long options you are long vega so uh, and obviously contrary to that if you have if you had 25 okay at 25 it was worth 3 point something if we really collapse this to 5 Okay, what happens to that? You can see the option price has collapsed from 3.22 to 1 point something. So if you had sold options, if you were very smart and you could see the collapse in ball coming, if you fo if you foresee a collapse in ball, okay, and you're bearish on the ball essentially and you sell the option, obviously you sold it at 3.22, now it has dropped to 1.01, .01, so you have a profit. Okay, you can buy it back at 1.01 .01 and make a profit. Okay, so this is of course ignoring bid offer spreads. But uh, then, so you can see it works both ways. Okay, so essentially we'll, we'll see, we'll see a further development of this when we're looking at the decision matrix. But mainly what you have to get familiar with these things. The concept that there are option sensitivities, okay and the cons and what are these sensitivities called what is delta what is gamma what is theta vega okay and rho you have to be familiar with these things and then you have to be also familiar with long options means long gamma long vega and negative theta and short option means uh, short vega short gamma and positive theta okay so you have to understand the dynamics of these uh, positions okay the sensitivity aspects of these positions okay so if we go here so this part is covered okay so i know where it is okay so i'm looking at the wrong file okay so i'll, I'll transfer this from here Okay, so the next point we need to cover is this, okay, we have to have a brief introduction to eyeball, okay, I'll just paste this into your notes so that you have, uh, so these, uh, these references are to the 9th edition, but when you have, what you have I think is the, uh, is the 10th edition, okay, uh, but I think you can just adjust it because I've given you the figure numbers. Just look at that same figure, uh, the 11.1. .1, if it says figure 11.1, .1, I've checked my ebook version of the 10th edition. It's the same. The figure is the same. So the figure doesn't. The 9th edition, the page numbers may be different. Okay, uh, but the so I'm just pasting all this into your notes so you will not have to write all this down. Okay, now we're going to discuss this topic. We're going to have a brief. Uh, we're going to have a brief look at implied volatility. Let's look at 
Okay, so let's first understand. Let's look at some charts of uh, eyeball. Okay, so what is eyeball? We can answer this on several levels. First, let's look at this. This link is provided to you. Okay, so I'm giving you a. We can actually make this. We can drag it back. So we can even look at one of your. Okay, so the red line is the eyeball. Let's make it. Uh, let's look at one of your other stocks. The Q, uh, the QQQ is also there in your notes, but let's see if we have eyeball data for Facebook. Oh, okay, I'll have to drag it back once again. I should have just kept it there. Would have spared me the. Okay, all right. So we are looking at Facebook now. Uh, so what you see here on the top. Uh, don't worry about the, the bottom is uh, don't worry about the bottom panel okay just just look at the star the top panel okay so you're seeing this uh, once again you can see what kind of data is this time series or cross-sectional time series data okay and it meets our definition what was our definition at least one variable for at least two period points of time okay so here you can see there are two variables which is within the uh, bounds of at least one variable okay so you have two variables you are looking at the stock price plus the eyeball okay so what is the eyeball at the first level when we look at eyeball we're looking at we're going to look at two intuitive answers and one mechanical answer okay so essentially the way we think about eyeball is we want to think of it as an indicator of how cheap or expensive the option is okay you're familiar with this word dearness dear means cheap you don't know some of you don't know when people get pensions you know there's something called dearness allowance yes, so that's reflecting the changes in the price level okay that is not for those who are dear and dear to you you have to give them an allowance <laughs> no it is cheap and dear means expensive okay so we want to use the way we think about eyeball and at an intuitive level at the first intuitive level we think about eyeball we are just going to think about it as a uh, indicator of general level of option prices that means when eyeballs are going down option prices in general are falling when eyeballs are going up option prices in general are rising okay so let's see i don't know i'm a little disappointed as to why this is not coming through uh, let me try and see uh, if we we'll try and launch something else everything is seems to be dead okay we'll try and launch something else here all the feed is dead i don't know why the feed is not coming through at all okay something really strange here let's see if we have any otc options available on the euro let's see we right click on this and we go to option trader do we have any no options are available these are otc options these guys are mainly into mm -hmm. exchange traded products of course this spot fx is an otc product uh, okay so we seem to have some kind of a problem with uh, but let me just show you something else okay let's look at um, bid ask okay, let me just try and try it here okay normally you would notice when you have data for your uh, when you do have uh, feed okay uh, when you do have a live feed you will notice that okay uh, you will notice that so we have uh, <coughs> what is the Microsoft price now that is also not available but one of the things you'll notice when you mouse over this okay this seems to be a data feed problem right now but when you mouse over this you'll notice one thing when you mouse over when you see it in the uh, in the evening or uh, in New York time when you mouse over the uh, bid and ask for the options in the option trader okay this is one of the reasons we use this software because very few other pieces of software will have all this information when you mouse over the bid and offer you'll see that it shows you a percentage figure 34.77 if you mouse over and see it okay at night you'll see that when the data is live hopefully then you'll see that there is a figure given 34.77 or something like that and you'll notice that the figures are actually the percentages are different for bid and ask okay so those percentages are the eyeballs okay so those percentages are the eyeballs for those particular options okay this bid and ask is for the option prices okay so uh, so this is for the 170 call okay with uh, this is only zero days we want to see something which is let's block this seven days is also too little 14 days is also too little let's look at this 21 days okay so you can see a little bit here 
they don't have implied volatility as well okay so when you mouse over you'll see that uh, when you mouse over you'll see that the percentage figure given those are the eyeballs for those option prices okay the bid and offer prices are slightly different okay so therefore they will have slightly different eyeballs okay we'll explain now eyeball but at least so far at the first level you understand eyeball is an indicator of how cheap or expensive the option is if the eyeball is eyeball is higher that means the option is more expensive if it's lower there is less, less expensive okay so here what you have in this chart is in this chart here what you have is a display of you have a display of Facebook stock prices this black stuff here this this uh, uh, sort of area chart this is known as an area chart right okay this is an area chart of Facebook stock prices okay and uh, the red line is the eyeballs okay so along with the stock prices you have they've plotted the eyeballs okay so essentially what is showing you is uh, on the ones uh, in one variable is uh, showing you how the stock price of Facebook has moved okay this is the part I was telling you about a couple of days ago when we had a discussion about how uh, stock prices can move in very erratic in a very erratic fashion where they announced earnings everything was on track earnings were all okay actually they might have even beat estimates but because the forecast was negative there was a massive drop in the share price okay if you look at uh, if you look at the uh, corresponding the daily uh, so the intraday chart you will see exactly how it dropped this is not uh, long enough yeah you understand see this is what I'm referring to that drop there this is the advantage of intraday data this drop here okay this is basically being shown to you here this drop so suddenly from here to here there's a big gap opening gap down only because their uh, guidance was negative guidance was not what the market was expecting okay so you can see this is what I meant by how whimsically the market behaves okay so uh, anyway so this is what you have here we go back to our discussion of eyeball so you see a plot of the stock price along with the eyeballs now you can see that one of the first things you should notice is how the eyeball charts uh, the movement of the eyeball chart is quite different it seems to be a different kind of animal because you notice that it, it doesn't really move like the stock price you notice it's kind of more uh, erratic like an ECG kind of thing it kind of seems to come back or more okay so it seems to have more of a mean rewarding tendency than the stock price typically if you look at it most of the eyeballs don't have such a strong because in stocks many stocks you can look at which will have a very strong uptrend okay but uh, in, in eyeballs generally they tend to have more of a mean rewarding tendency so you should notice this as you eyeball the charts so what is this line telling you essentially it is giving you an index overall of all the Facebook options put together okay all options on Facebook when they look at their prices they extract the eyeball from the prices they can take an average of that so this is an eyeball index for Facebook options okay so basically it's telling you how Facebook options have moved in terms of whether they're expensive at this point they were most expensive okay and maybe at this point they were the least expensive okay if you look at it all right so the ball is given here so it's point to me low least expensive was around say 18% or 19% and most expensive when it's most expensive the ball went to nearly 100% I guess something like 95% you see this here 0 0.8 okay so this looks like even 92 95 percent okay when this stuff was starting to come down okay so for some reason there seems to be a, a big jump in the ball so you see how this is how the eyeball behaves all right so we'll see so so we are just trying to learn a little bit about eyeball because it's very important in option trading so the first thing we learn about eyeball is that it's an index of option prices okay and you can use this this link is already in your notes so this is what you're going to do for each of the stocks that you have in your trading universe in your project all right okay so um, then option volume is not so important so is everyone clear about the concept now we we'll learn more and more about it but at least you have a first level understanding that eyeball if you want to get a good picture of how uh, option prices on Facebook have moved over the last whatever this I think this what couple of years or something yeah since November um, yeah seems to be November 2017 so I guess almost about two years or so okay roughly about two years so it's quite a lot of data for eyeball given that you're getting it free normally you have to pay for eyeball data but there's some sites which you get some free eyeball data which becomes very important in option trading because you have to form a view on eyeball as well all right okay 
So is everyone clear so far? Eyeball is an index of option prices. This is one of the ways you can get a plot of eyeball. You give, you get an idea that uh, where, so it gives you some idea that you know it has gone as far high as, uh, as almost 95%, but now it's near the low of the range, okay? So, uh, okay. So let's go back to other stuff that we can study about eyeball. So this, so essentially going back to the components of the option price, remember we looked at IV, uh, I, intrinsic value and time value, that the total price of the option consists of intrinsic value and time value. Remember we had the discussion earlier, that's why you need to keep revising, all right. So essentially what eyeball affects is, eyeball doesn't affect the intrinsic value, okay, because the intrinsic value is a function of the, what intrinsic value comes from what? Does anyone remember? We discussed intrinsic value. Does it sound familiar? Is this someone you know? Intrinsic value? Yes. Yeah, good. So current price minus strike price. Okay, you compare the strike price with the current price. Maybe not always minus, but compare the current market price for the underlying versus the strike price. Okay, so in this case, this is what kind of option? And the intrinsic value is related to which three concepts? In the money, at the money, in the money, at the money and out of the money. Okay. So ATM, although you normally take money from an ATM, but at the ATM, there's no money, okay? <laughs> because ATM is at the money, all right? So this one is, this is what kind of money, this kind of, what kind of option? This At this stage, at the money. Now, if I change the exercise price to uh, 80, this becomes in the money, okay? All right, so here we say essentially the intrinsic value is something close to eight, uh, twenty dollars basically. All right, because we compare how much money we can make by buying the option and uh, immediately exercising it and um, uh, selling off the stock, exercising it, and then squaring the position in the underlying immediately. So this is a call option. So if we buy the call option, okay, then we have. Uh, we get to buy at 80 and the underlying is 100 okay so we make 20 dollars okay this actually gives you the pv of the uh, uh, of the difference of 20 dollars okay would be the inter inter intrinsic value but in this case what is happening is you get this and uh, so so this is your intrinsic value okay and if i make this 120 then this is what kind of option or 125 otm okay so this is our other money all right so essentially what was i saying that here the eyeball so since the the intrinsic value component of the option price is affected only by the difference between the strike and the underlying okay strike uh, the current price of the underlying and the strike price of the option that's what affects the intrinsic value so the time value component is what is affected by the eyeball this is clear yeah there are two components to the option price the intrinsic value and the time value so what the eyeball affects when we are saying that the eyeball is an index of how expensive or cheap the option is okay so the eyeball affects which component of the option price it affects the time value component of the option price yes sir what's your question eyeball price okay we're coming to that what you're saying is is uh, almost correct in terms of how we define eyeball but we are coming to that that's a mechanical part of the definition we have to understand eyeball at different levels okay so right now there are three ways to understand three levels at which we can understand eyeball initially we are going to do only two levels okay uh, and then we'll get into the third level because the third level requires us to calculate uh, age fall age fall is historical volatility Okay, if we say H wall, we mean historical volatility, and I wall is implied volatility. So we are not. We are going to do only two levels. So that what what you are saying will come in the second part, which we are doing now, which we are going to do now. So the first part is that I wall is an index of option prices, and it is affecting I wall is affecting the uh, cheapness and dearness of options. Okay, and uh, it, sorry, I wall is affecting the uh, the time value component. Okay. All right, so you can have essentially, so so the point to understand here is because you have this kind of a situation, all right, now the first thing you have to understand here is that because the intrinsic value is affected by the distance between the exercise price and the, uh, so let's keep this as a 100 exercise price. So it's affected by the distance between the exercise price and the current underlying price, okay? So once you buy the option, obviously the exercise price doesn't change anymore because it's a fixed option that you bought this 125 strike call or you bought the 100 strike call, okay? What changes after that is the underlying moves around. The underlying keeps moving around, okay? So now after you bought this, okay? Now what can happen is one of the ways your option can lose value is that 
your uh, the uh, thing can go from 100 to the underlying can go from 100 to 90 in which case your call option becomes essentially uh, almost worthless okay because the call levels are also very low okay so the, this is one way your option can lose value okay because after you bought a call the underlying might drop okay so th this will make your option lose value but one way your option can gain value is if we change everything being say we change the call from 5 to 90 as you saw the facebook wall in fact has actually been moving in two years from say about 18 to about 95 okay so now what happens can you see the difference yes. the underlying hasn't moved <coughs> But the eyeball has jumped massively from 5 to 90. Okay, this is a little bit of an abnormal jump. But the point I'm trying, I'm just trying to make a point here. Okay, that your loss of value due to the negative move in the underlying. Theoretically, it's possible. So you have to understand this that there are two components. So this is, should be a theoretical framework in your the theoretical framework in your head that there are two components to the option price: the IV and the uh, time value. Now the IV is affected by the distance between the strike price and the underlying price and the underlying price. Is this clear? Okay. So after you buy it, the strike price can't change because you have bought a fixed option. Okay. Uh, you have crystallized the option that you have bought. Okay. But what does change after you bought the option is the underlying keeps moving around. Right. So as the underlying keeps moving around, the intrinsic value component of your option price will move around. Also, it will keep fluctuating. Is that clear? The first part is clear, which we showed you just now that when the ball was very low, so the time value element and the time is also not very long, 30 days. Okay. So the time value essentially gets affected by this, the days until expiration and the ball mainly. Okay. So the we saw that the because the underlying dropped from 100 to 90, the option almost became worthless. It became zero essentially. Okay. But then as we changed the eyeball, we dramatically increased the eyeball. Okay. The ball input. Okay. That made the option jump up in value from zero to five point whatever. Okay. Do you see that? Okay. So the point to understand here is that there are two components, intrinsic value and time value. And the time value is affected by, of course, the length of the option, which also doesn't change once you buy it. Once you bought a 30 day option, that's it. You bought a 30 day option. Now you can't go and say, now please make this a six month option. Okay. So that's also locked in. Your strike is also locked in. But what does change is the market's estimate of the ball, which is essentially the eyeball. Okay. Which we'll come to now as we come look at the second aspect of eyeball. That will become clearer. But take it from me right now that the eyeball is the market's estimate of the ball input. So that can also fluctuate as you can see here in this Facebook chart. It is not constant this red line it's moving around okay and quite wildly as well okay so it is moving around as the stock trades the eyeball is moving around so therefore this also fluctuates so not only does the stock price so here you can actually see visually the two contributors to the uh, components of an option price the underlying price movement which you can see in the area chart the blue area chart is the stock price the stock price is moving around and that's going to keep changing your intrinsic value right the stock price is moving around then in the meantime the eyeball is also moving around okay so the eyeball essentially is the ball input into the option OVM which will just just wait for a while you understand it a little better but the eyeball is essentially the ball input into the OVM okay so that uh, into one of the ball inputs into the OVM so that will that is also moving around that's affecting the time value Okay, that's affecting the time value. Is this clear? Everyone is following that? The time value, as I told you, is affected by two things the days to expiration and the eyeball. Okay, mainly. But once you bought the option, the days to expiration also doesn't change because you have crystallized the option that you're buying. You told the dealer that you want a six month option. You bought the option from, I want a six month option with a 125 strike. Now you bought it. Now, of course, you can't change the terms of that contract. Okay, you bought a six month option with a 125 strike. But what does change is the eyeball, as you can see, it's moving around. So the market's estimate of the vol, the fair value of the vol is changing around. So the vol input, and therefore that can have an impact on the order. So this affects the red line. This affects the eyeball, affects the time value component. Okay. So the point I was trying to show you just now by making these inputs is that you really don't know what the net effect of those two will be. The point I'm trying to emphasize here is that one may go one way and the other may go the other way. All right. So your uh, the intrinsic value may drop. The intrinsic value may drop because the underlying has moved against you. 
right? Which we showed you just now, right? That if we have this situation, that we have this 90, we make this drop further. We drop it to say 85. And what happens to the call price is 5.77. The call price drops 3.97, okay. But the point is that this drop from 3.97, if I really radically increase this, because I'm trying to make a point, okay. So here what has happened is the negative move in the underlying has adversely affected your intrinsic value. Okay, so the option has dropped because we have not changed the time value. But now if I radically increase the, let's say I increase the ball input from 90 to 145, I'm doing it deliberately because I want to increase the price dramatically. Okay, now you see what happens. The price has gone above that 5.77 which we had earlier. So what is happening, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that uh, you don't know which way each component will go. They may both go in your favor. They may both go against you or one may go in your favor and one may go against you. Are you following? Yes, when I'm talking about the underlying price movement and how it affects your option price through the impact on the intrinsic value. Yes? And then the ta the ball input also affects, the eyeball also affects your option price through the impact on the time value. So there are two sources of impact. Two factors are driving the option price, right, after you have bought it. Is this clear? Right? Yes? So two factors are driving, so they can actually go both, they, they can both go against you, they can both go in your favor, or one can go against you and one can go in your favor, and the net effect may be either break even or it could be in one direction leaning in one direction or the other direction are you following this point this is just a simple point to understand at this stage through this framework that the option price has two components the iv uh, intrinsic value and the uh, the time value then and the intrinsic value is affected by distance between the option price and the and the and at the option price and the exercise price uh, sorry what am I saying? The uh, intrinsic value is affected by the distance between the exercise price and the underlying price. Okay, and the underlying price is moving around, so it keeps on changing the intrinsic value. And the eyeball is affected, uh, the time value is affected by the days to expiration, which is fixed after you buy the option, and mainly otherwise it's affected by the eyeball, and the eyeball keeps fluctuating as well. Okay, so these two sources of uh, impact will may have you know unpredictable how they are going to affect the total value of the option is this point clear okay all right so this is one uh, useful framework for thinking about uh, options okay so we have learned something else now you can actually we can actually follow along from here because it's already there in your all right so this is your first part of the uh, answer to eyeball what is, what is eyeball we answered at three levels the first is the intuitive answer number one which is that it's an indicator of option prices okay so that's this is what i'm saying here so what is written here is basically nothing but what i just showed you that the impact you don't know what the net impact is going to be all right okay so essentially what we are saying this we have already talked about okay that when eyeball rises option prices rise and fall okay so okay now we come to the mechanical answer okay which is uh, which we i think we discussed briefly earlier but we are going to understand this again once uh, once again okay we're going to try and put this we're going to just all this is already there in your notes i'm not just i'm just not going there because it's, it's on a different uh, application window so it helps me to toggle easier if i do it here okay so the mechanical answer to what is eyeball okay so read the mechanical answer a little bit okay you'll notice um, okay what is this this is the model okay this is a val fair value model okay for options it has a bunch of inputs it throws out an output and then from put call parity you get the put call put option value okay so we just focus on the call option right now this is a ovm for call options okay now the ovm has a bunch of inputs okay so as you change the inputs the out output will change okay now this as we already <coughs> as we already discussed this ball is a forward looking input remember we discussed it so this is meant to be your forecast of the ball now this discussion is not really uh, fully uh, comprehensible until you understand how ball is calculated okay that is the third level of understanding of eyeball which we will come to later 
after calculating historical volatility. So at this point, we just say that this is the market's forecast and vol we are just understanding as, okay, how is the market, how is the stock price, how rapidly is the stock price moving around, okay? So if you just look at this, Facebook, you can see it's quite dramatic. The movements are quite dramatic, okay? So although on a net basis, it's kind of where it was, let's say in December 2017. So it's almost two years. The price has actually not moved on a net basis. But in between there, you can see there's a lot of drama, right? Up and down, up and down, all kinds of stuff happening. All right. So uh, so it's pretty volatile actually, as you can see. And um, so what you, uh, so what was I saying? Um, no, this is not what, uh, okay. So, the, so, so yeah, so what I was saying is this part that actually that the wall input is a forward looking input. Okay, so wall input is a forward looking, what is the OVM? What is your, just remember another fair value model which you guys are all familiar with. Your, let's say you take your uh, Gordon growth model. Okay, which is an example of a fair value model. What are you doing? You're inputting, what are the inputs? The dividends, the forecast of dividends. Okay, what are the, what are the inputs in the Gordon growth model? What are the exogenous variables in the Gordon? Let's do a quick recap. What are the exogenous variables in the Gordon growth model? Yes, people are not clear. Shivam? No idea. Exogenous variables, you know who Gordon is? Gordon Greenwich used to play for the West Indies, you remember? <laughs> Gordon Greenwich, you don't remember. Before your time, long, long back. Gordon growth model, you don't remember? Okay, anybody wants to answer? What are the inputs into the Gordon growth model? Take the mic and answer. Is my question clear? What are the exogenous variables for the, you remember the Gordon growth model? No? Didn't you do it in your FM1? FM2? So no one remembers the Gordon growth model. So how are we going to function now? How are you going to do your corporate finance modeling course? Which you are doing already. These are one of the, these, this is one of the basic equity valuation models, stock valuation models. Okay. Yes. Anybody? Inputs. Dividend. Okay. One is dividends. Then, in the most uh, well-defined or mo most fully formed version of the model, dividend. Then, growth rate of what? Go through it now. Dividends. Okay. So one is dividend, current dividend. Then is the growth rate of dividends. And my question is, what are the exogenous variables in the Gordon growth model? So do we have any more exogenous variables? Dividend. There she has mentioned dividend and the growth rate of dividends. Dividend is written as D. Usually written as D. Yes. D upon R assumes what? Constant dividends or growth rate, some growth rate of dividends? D upon R is constant dividends, okay? So she's introduced another factor. So in, inadvertently you've given me a third factor which you uh, were not conscious of that you were giving me an answer. That is R. You've forgotten the model, okay? So the model, the dividend growth, uh, the Gordon growth model, See, this is a situation. If this your, you guys, you guys are finance students, so you should already be familiar with all the models that you've covered. You should be familiar with now with the new terminology that I've given you, uh, the comprehensive terminology, inputs, outputs, endogenous, exogenous, forecast variables, predictive variables. All this stuff should be at your fingertips, and you don't even know. Most of you don't even know who Gordon the Greenwich is. Okay, you don't know who Gordon, what the Gordon growth model is. Okay, so. Um, what are we uh, session outline here? We are talking about this. So in between, what I'm going to do is before the mechanical answer, I'm just going to write a little bit here about the Gordon growth model. Okay. So what is the endogenous variable in the Gordon growth model? Anybody remembers? Value of the stock. Okay. So is this an objective endogenous variable or? <coughs> Subjective. Is this endogenous variable? Is this a s objective figure or a subjective figure? Hmm? Subjective. subjective. Why is it subjective? Because 
assumptions, assumptions about what? The growth, rate, growth, rate, rate, growth rate and dividends. Okay, so understand these basic things because we already had the uh, initial preliminary discussion, which you were also not aware of, about the difference between price and value, and what is subjective and what is pro objective. But you have clarified. We have clarified that now. Okay, that price. If I say what is the price of Facebook? That's objective 180.15 closing price in New York yesterday. No room for anyone to argue about that. This is price. This is 100% objective. Okay. Now, if I say the fair value of Facebook is $220, according to my estimate of the uh, based on my use of the Gordon Growth model, that is subjective. Because why is it subjective? Because that that value of $220 is it's yeah, it's based on mainly it's based on no specifically what you have to say is based on my subjective assessments of the dividends. If I've used the Gordon growth model to arrive at this value, okay, then it's based on my subjective assessments of what the dividends will be. All right, what have I done in the Gordon growth model? I have projected Facebook dividends. I've taken maybe the current dividend. I've projected a growth rate for the dividend. So the endogenous variables in that model, the exogenous variables in that model are the dividend. Okay, the current dividend you can almost say is you can just take it from the current uh, level. So you can almost say that there are, uh, so it's not really a variable because it's it just, you just take it from, it's, it's not subject to a forecast. You take the current dividend. So the real forecast values, the dividend is an input in the model, but the real forecast value the subjectivity comes from the growth rate of the dividends that I'm forecasting and the discount rate that I'm using because the dis discount rate is also not sacrosanct so the discount rate is going to be the cost of equity or the WAC if I'm using the Gordon growth model the discount rate should be the cost of equity or the WAC that also is not clear you're doing corporate finance modeling course you already started your basics should be clear is my question clear cost of equity why why not back yeah so essentially what you say dividends is paid to what kind of provider of capital the provider of equity capital yes. so that's why you're discounting it by the cost of equity okay so the r should be the cost of equity right this is clear now you have these two uh, so the real subjectivity comes because you take the current level of the dividend from what that we know historically that's still an input in the model but the real subjectivity subjectivity is coming from the forecast of the dividends and your estimate of the cost of equity because cost of equity is also coming out from where how do you get the estimate of the cost of equity by applying a CAPM kind of model which again is a subjective model it's a fair value model so understand that CAPM cost of equity is also so you should understand these are all when we want to make it very clear that it's a subjective model by saying fair value model okay so it's a, anyway value itself is subjective but you can make it in your learning stages you can deliberately use the term fair value models you should understand it's a fair value model so cost of equity CAPM's cost of equity model is also a fair value model okay again it's based on your expectations about the equity risk premium because again that's supposed to be a forward-looking uh, figure remember that it's supposed to be a forward-looking figure then your estimate of the beta also you although you estimate it from historical thing in the model it's actually supposed to be a forward-looking figure what will be the beta, uh, the sensitivity of the stock you're just using a historical data to estimate it but what the model expects is an input for a forward-looking figure are you following mechanically what people are getting caught up in the fact that they use historical beta but you have to understand this is these are some of the flaws of the model but actually what the model expects what the model expects is a forward looking because what is the cost of equity you are applying it to future cash flows you are applying it to future dividends so the cost of equity is what should be applicable in the future that should be based on your estimate of the beta of the future which you just happen to be doing by calculating historical beta but actually what you're saying is you're making a forecast for the future beta you're making a forecast for the future equity risk premium are you clear you should be clear about these things that because your cash flows apply to the future so this cost of equity is also what is the cost of equity that is appropriate for future cash flows therefore it is based on your estimates of the future people don't realize it because they get so caught up in the mechanical application of the uh, beta is calculated by looking at historical data right 
and then you calculate equity risk premium also by looking at historical data but these are all conceptually problematic because it's like I'm saying uh, what is it, how much rain is going to fall in, uh, in November I'm just looking at how much rain fell, fell in October and I'm using it to forecast how much rain will fall in November but we should be clear that the figure I'm giving is my forecast for rain in November I may have estimated it from the rain in October are you following what I'm saying so you should not lose sight of these things that when you're applying the cost of equity model in the CAPM it is again a forward-looking model because you're using it to discount future cash flows okay so it should not be lost on uh, you that this is actually a forward so these models are highly problematic because of these factors that do you think it's very sound conceptually for me to forecast the rainfall in November based on what we saw in October no. okay it might work but conceptually it's not really sound okay but that's why you see so when you use these models people just get caught up in most MBA schools what happens is people just come in and then they start calculating beta from historical figures they're not really thinking about this concept of subjectivity and whether this is a forward-looking forecast okay so these these things you have to be aware of because this is what the model actually what the model is expecting is giving to give you uh, is expecting you to give them a, a forward-looking forecast okay so where was I so this is subjective because fair value if I say fair value of Facebook is 220 using the Gordon growth model I've taken the dividends from today okay but I've, I'm I'm subjectively applying a growth rate of dividends I'm subjectively deriving a cost of equity because my cost of equity and Paro's cost of equity for Facebook may be different because when she's using the same we may be using the same CAPM model for cost of equity but maybe she's using a different estimate for the equity risk premium maybe she's using a different estimates for the beta because even the beta is supposed to be a forward-looking beta what will be the sensitivity of the Facebook stock to the movements in the uh, market okay excess return on the Facebook stock versus excess return on the market all of these are forward-looking estimates you just happen to be using historical data so Parul may have a different figure for cost of equity so she will end up having a different fair value estimate of Facebook she might say no no the fair value of Facebook is $160 okay so these are subjective okay so the fair value model so the cotton growth model is a subjective fair value model okay which has the fair value as Tanya mentioned is the fair value of the Facebook of Facebook common stock okay it's giving you an output the endogenous variable is the fair value of Facebook common stock as a function of so it basically models the lingo that we use is using the Gordon growth model we have modeled the fair value of Facebook common stock as a function of its current dividend the projected growth rate of dividends and the estimated cost of equity is this clear you have to use the lingo also properly what are we modeling as a function of what in the in the CAPM cost of equity model we are modeling what are we modeling cost of equity we are modeling the cost of equity as a function of the risk-free rate the estimated equity risk premium and the estimated beta is this clear so this lang lingo also should be clear with the basic theory of models your all the different ways endogenous exogenous input variable inputs and outputs forecast explanatory then what are you modeling as a function of what this concept of what is subjective what is whether it's a fair value model okay then versus price which is objective okay to understand when is a subjective and when the inputs are forward looking like you can see here it's not so simple you look at this option for the OVM some of the estimates are forward looking some of the inputs are forward looking and some are not okay like vol is forward looking okay dividend yield is also forward looking technically but it's not so prone to error okay this is not forward looking if I'm looking at a 180 day option okay I know what the interest rate if I'm valuing a 180 day option today I know what the interest rate is for 180 days it's not a forward-looking estimate it's not a subjective element of that uh, this does not contribute to the subjectivity of the model as far as if you look at the interest rate alone underlying price is also an input but this is not also a subjective input because I can see what the underlying price is in the market this is clear so when you look at a model you should analyze it in this way what are the endogenous variables what are the exogenous variables which is which are the inputs which are subjective which are forward-looking subjective forecasts like here the wall is a forward-looking subjective forecast the what else is a subjective forecast here 
this is also a subjective forecast but not much of a problem okay and this is not a forecast this we can see in the market what the thing is this also is given by the user this is also given by the user yeah. and this is also not a subjective forecast the real problem in this OVM lies in the where this is where the real problem lies this is where this is what really makes it an, uh, a fair value model a subjective model okay that's why if you see I put it as uh, the reason I put it as a uh, not a proper application of the if we go back to the students FBRM calc why have I listed it under because they use arbitrage free valuation principles to arrive at the fair value estimates of the call price okay but it is not truly arbitrage okay it's not truly arbitrage free because there's a massive subjective element in the model okay which is a forecast okay that makes it subjective and we have no way of knowing whether this will be true just like when I'm projecting the growth rate of dividends for Facebook I have no way of knowing that my forecasts are correct maybe power is correct maybe the growth rate is actually much lower and the fair value should be much lower okay so there's no way to tell who is right so this is where the subjectivity comes from this is why I have put this here under DP4 paradigms okay so you're getting you're getting a little bit of a flavor as to why because we haven't really covered arbitrage free valuation properly we haven't covered classical risk risk arbitrage but the reason I'm, I'm giving you some kind of I'm giving you the answers in layers okay that why have I put option valuation models AFE because they use AFE principles but it's improperly called AFE models because it's, it's improperly called an AFE model because in, in a true AFV model, there will be no subjective forecast. Okay, everything will be known today itself. Everything is based on market. All the inputs are based, all the inputs are current market prices, which you can observe. Nothing so uncertain about it. Just like here, just like here, nothing uncertain about the underlying price. It's an input in the model, but nothing uncertain about it. Nothing uncertain about interest rates. Input in the model, but we can observe today's interest rates for six months. Okay, so the real source of when you look at a model, you should understand basically what is the structure of the model. Is it talking about some nonsensical relationship? Okay, maybe uh, what is some kind of you know you heard this term spurious correlation. When you did correlation, did you hear about this term called spurious correlation? So spurious correlation is you can't come up with some kind of you know strange relationships. Maybe the amount the rice planted in Bangladesh is affecting some you know rainfall in Tanzania or something like that which has basically no reason to expect that this will affect the other okay but you find that there's some correlation maybe number of mobile phones bought in Tanzania is affected is highly correlated with uh, you know acreage of rice in Bangladesh I mean there's no reason to expect that it's correlated but you just see high correlation okay so that's called spurious correlation and you try to say that there's some kind of relationship but actually there's no reason so the theoretical basis of the model so when you come up with a model you should also look at when you are evaluating models you should evaluate the is the theoretical soundness of the model okay uh, is that uh, is the model theoretically sound in terms of what it is postulating as a relationship between inputs and outputs okay so model is basically as we learn is a mathematical a precise mathematical relationship between inputs and outputs okay so you have two problems one is that do, do, the, do you reason do, do you have a reason to believe that the output should be related to the inputs in the first place and the second is do you agree with the specification of how the model has been written okay that's the second level of evaluation then you look at all the inputs and the outputs which are subjective which are so you should evaluate a model from these aspects okay uh, at least from these aspects yes are you following so far yes sir. okay so where were we why did we get into this discussion so the reason I've called it improperly so called is because it includes at least one of the inputs is a subjective uh, element which is highly prone to error in terms of estimation okay there are two subjective elements the dividend yield and the wall but the dividend yield is not so prone to error because it doesn't move around that much okay it doesn't there's not that much uncertainty about it but this one is very uncertain the wall as you can see moves around a lot okay so therefore this is a problem okay so what was I talking about here we are coming to the wall input in between I got lost in the Gordon growth model and I had to give you a big lecture because I could see that nobody <laughs> remembers the Gordon growth model so uh, you better revise all this stuff because the DGSL catches you like this if you don't even remember the Gordon growth model then he'll give you a firing 
so before that you better revise all your models okay so all the models you've done okay mpv subjective or objective subjective. subjective because it's based the npv is really affected by your subjective estimates of the project cash flows okay as well as your subjective discount rate and between the two you should be aware that really the problem comes really from the cash flows because the discount rate really doesn't vary so much so uh, it's kind of like the what we said in the dividend yield about in the obm right the real problem comes from the cash flow estimates okay those are the ones that go horribly wrong okay and that's why you have problems okay so so npv subjective ir Subjective. 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 Okay. What is the endogenous var variable in the IRR model? Yes. IRR. What is the endogenous variable in the IRR model? Yes. What is Tarun saying? What is the endogenous variable? One minute. Let Tarun answer. Cash flow is the you are saying cash flows are the endogenous variable. No, I am saying IRR. You are saying IRR. So he is right. In the IRR model, the IRR is the endogenous. So this basic stuff with stuff that you guys have all covered. Okay. So now we have given you some additional concepts of looking at exogenous, endogenous, input, output, explanatory forecast. What else did we discuss? Dependent, independent. So you should be going this and you're going back and revising at least your basic concepts what you've learned. All the models, analyze it in this framework, understand what is the endogenous variable, what is the exogenous variable. Okay? And we still haven't addressed our old question of NPV versus IRR. Not sorry, not NPV versus IRR. Bond YTM versus IRR. I gave you a question on that. Go and think about that also. What is the mathematical difference between bond YTM and project IRR? That's your question in your, it's there in your notes. Go back and revise all this stuff because when DG sir catches you for all these questions, if your basics are not clear, because essentially what I think we'll be doing in this course, I think is basically just applying these concepts with some additional refinements in Excel. Okay, so that's a useful concept. Mainly we have to get your fundamentals 100% clear. Then fancy tricks you can learn later on. Okay, so, but at least your concept should be clear. And basic models, you should have. Uh, you understand. You should remember the basic models that you've done. Okay. Right. Now I remember when I was asking about models. Uh, Sakshi remembered uh, arbitrage pricing theory as one of the models you've done. So you should remember all these things. Arbitrage pricing theory again. You should go back and see. It's actually quite a useless, a totally useless model. So I wouldn't waste you. I wouldn't uh, direct you to waste your time on that. But you'll be doing uh, some of this stuff and uh, at least if you revise your NPV. IRR, uh, current growth model, your enterprise value. Did you do enterprise value calculations? No, sir. Operating cash flow. Operating cash flow. Yeah. So that you estimate uh, estimate the inter enterprise value using that method. Okay. So do some reading on these. Take your corporate finance textbooks and do some reading on this. Revise all these theoretical concepts. So when are you getting in? When you are getting into the Excel programming part of it. The uh, spreadsheet programming, let me use a general expression, that's spreadsheet programming, okay? We should not say Excel because we don't really mean Excel to the exclusion of Google Sheets and, you know, uh, Zoho Sheets and all the other stuff. So, open open office uh, calc, okay? So, spreadsheet programming, when you're getting into that, your concept should be 100% clear. Is this clear? Okay. All right, so let's move on now, coming back to a, a mechanical answer to eyeball. Are you guys following so far? What is happening? Some water water distribution. There's some water problem. Okay. There seems to be some water distribution problem. Maybe you should call the people from the corporation. Okay. Okay. Uh, so mechanical answer to now we are understanding. We're coming back after a little interlude with the Gordon growth model, which I hope was useful because you understood that you did not remember the Gordon growth model. Okay. So we are coming back to the second way of answering the question of what is I want. Okay. Now, what I was saying earlier is if you look at, do we have anything here? We still don't have it. Okay. So when you go back and look, hopefully you'll get the live feed and you look at Microsoft options. Okay. Make sure you're choosing the right day with uh, at least 21 days to go. Okay. Some slightly longer term option. Okay. Look at this bid and ask. You will see there's a percentage figure given and the ask percentage figure will be higher than the bid percentage figure okay because the these are the eyeball numbers okay it will give it to you with 34.77 34.95 and so 
on so something like that okay some percentage figures will be given when you mouse over okay those are the eyeballs for the bid and ask because the ask will be higher than the bid yes. okay so therefore the eyeball for the ask will be higher than the eyeball for the bid because the eyeball is nothing but an index of option prices okay it's a uh, it's an indicator of option prices okay so now what is this basically when you look at this up let's say the prices are two and three just for the sake of argument that's the prices are two and three okay and we are going to just consume we are just going to concentrate on um, okay so uh, let's make this let's say the prices are let's say the fair price we'll just take an average price here we'll just take the average of the two let's say the average of the two is uh, say 3.5 okay the average price here for this 175 call is uh, is uh, 3.5 okay now we have to get so what we work is now this is the market price remember now we are getting into the difference of understanding the difference between price and value okay so here when you look at the microsoft options in the uh, in the market okay you see that the 175 call i don't even know what the uh, the current market price is but let's say i think this will be somewhere let's say 160 okay so uh, let's look at the 160 call let's say and then we have a price of let's say the average price between the bid and ask is 3.5 okay so 160 call with about 20 days to go let's i'm just giving you an idea so we look at the uh, call price in the market and we see that it's 3.5 okay we observe the market price of the 160 call is 3.5 all right and let's say what we get here now i have to create a situation where um, I have to reduce this call. Um, let's put 35. Okay, so it's 4.36. Okay, so let's assume that this is actually, uh, you know, this is 160 or whatever. Let's say, let's say we look at the Microsoft call. I don't want to make have to waste too much time making changes here. Let's say we look at the uh, the underlying price for Microsoft is hundred dollars. Okay, and we are looking at a hundred strike call for 30 days. Okay, and let's say we look at the market price, and we find that the market price for this call is say. Uh, let's say if, uh, we see say it's four okay now for the sake of argument i'll change it from 3.5 to four okay so now i find that my estimate now where is the subjectivity now remember this is an ovm okay this is a fair value model okay so it need not have anything to do with the price it need not be connected to the price in any meaningful way because it's a the way of arriving at it is totally different the price is just based on interaction between buyers and sellers demand and supply okay so you want to, you heard this term called price discovery so you heard this term called price discovery okay so it's an important term to be aware of because we didn't have enough time to do our markets module properly price discovery is nothing but uh, the process by which you uh, the market keeps on setting a price for a particular asset okay so you can see in the facebook market which is open in a normal way from about 9 30 in the us to about 4 15 okay uh, and in that time what is happening is the market is continuously accommodating buyers and sellers bids and offers okay transactions are taking place and through that process the market is setting a price for the stock of facebook which as you can see the price has fluctuated in the last two years very wildly between 220 and 120 okay now it is around the same where it started the last two years two years ago so this is what is happening the market is continuously through the interaction of price uh, supply and demand the market is uh, providing for price discovery okay this is why people prefer free markets because in free markets you have uh, you know basically the best form of price discovery but you don't uh, don't exclude any kind of like in facebook market facebook stock is essentially a free market because even you can set up an account with interactive brokers or any other broker in the us and start trading in for facebook stock they don't have capital controls so they don't really monitor who is coming in who is going out okay so everybody in the world can pile in and start trading facebook stock and that's how the price is getting uh, set all the time okay so there's an important function of free markets is to enable price discovery okay all right so what is happening is now this same thing is happening with option prices also option prices are also being set 
in a panel like this there's continuous buying and selling and we have a particular price of let's say four uh, four dollars which is being set okay and uh, so if we see that the market price for the Microsoft option okay which we are going to just pretend is actually a, a hundred strike call or with the underlying at hundred we're going to pretend that the actual market underlying is hundred dollars and the exercise price is hundred dollars okay so uh, and there's a 30 days to expiration and we observe that the market price is only four dollars but now when I put in the OBM where is the subjective to the according to me the ball that is going to happen in the future for the next 30 days the annualized figure for that ball just like when a bank is setting FDs for the next one month that FD rate applies to the next one month but it is stated in an annualized percentage right we say we pay six percent for the next one month doesn't mean that you'll get six percent per one six percent per annum but it will be applied to the next one month right everything is stated in percentage per annum for terms similarly with ball it's, it's a percentage per annum figure so i'm saying that over the next 30 days we are going to experience ball at 35 percent per annum okay in the same way that we talk about interest rates okay now this is my view okay i haven't consulted the market but when i put in this 35 input i see that the option price that's coming out the call option price is 4.36 but when i look at the market i find that the market is pricing the call at four dollars okay so now if i want to make my fair value estimate converge to the market price if i want to just let's say do that exercise i want to make my fair value estimate converge to the market price okay just for so be with me with the, with that idea for a while that i want to if i want to so basically i'm asking myself that question because obviously the main source of variation is everybody knows what this is this is objective this is also specified uh, this is also objective this is specified this is also objective everyone knows this one there's a little bit of doubt but for 30 days very uncertain very little uncertainty in the dividend yield the real problem is here why is my OVM giving a different output of uh, 4.362 for the call option price when the market is pricing at 4 that means my ball estimate is higher than the markets or lower than the markets is my question clear when I am running my OVM okay at 35% ball input I get a call option price of 4. Point, I, I get a fair value for the call at 4.36 but when I look in the market for the same call I see that the market is pricing that call at four dollars so my question is when I go back to my OVM uh, is my ball input into the OVM higher than what ball the market is using higher, higher. 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 okay that's why I'm getting a higher fair value for the call okay so now if I do this now if I therefore my question is now the question in my mind is okay at what ball input into my OVM would the OVM output of the fair value of the call be equal to the market price for every ball input in the OVM there will be a output for the call option price okay but there is one particular ball input value into the OVM which will throw out a model output which is exactly equal to the market price right so let me reduce it let me make it maybe 33 and see what happens okay I need to reduce it further so let's try 30 no, that's too little no? that's 31 that's my age right okay no yeah 32 okay okay I've never aged so quickly but we'll try it okay 31.5 okay almost there 31 point seven five okay almost there okay. Okay. so now this is exactly this is exactly how I was derived okay so normally when I write that X is equal to uh, Y is equal to you know a plus BX okay then I can also write that x is equal to y minus a by b if I write y is equal to a plus bx then I can write x is equal to y minus a by b right so that is an algebraic manip manipulation okay so that is also a model that is also a form of a specification of a model that y is equal to a plus bx yes so 
Uh, no, but the other inputs are all known. But See, look at the. Hmm? Yeah, dividend yield is subjective, but for a 30 day option, okay, as I said, dividend yield, you're right, theoretically you're correct that dividend yield is also subjective, but dividend yield normally is, as I said, dividend does, the dividends don't fluctuate that much, okay. So, just like you're in your NPV model, okay, the if you if you end up making a big mistake, okay, the mistake is more likely to your uh, erroneous estimation of the cash flows rather than an er erroneous estimation of the discount rate okay because the discount rate is usually not that big a source of error okay and it doesn't have a wide range of values also within reasonable limits so dividend yield also because companies dividends don't fluctuate that much they usually only change it when they actually have no choice they don't cut the dividend unless because it sends a very bad signal so companies try to maintain the dividend so therefore dividend yield doesn't fluctuate that much compared to how much vol fluctuates in the market okay as you saw here in two years how much has the ball fluctuated in the case of facebook options the ball fluctuates a lot and this you're looking at only closing prices for the day you do, you don't see from this chart you can't figure out how much the ball has fluctuated during the day what is the range of values during the day you have no idea about that by looking at this in fact this night 1.95 percent closing the high of the day might have been 1.2 or something like that okay so again Hardik and Surbi are going to lose points I can see again Hardik is showing her something and for Surbi is smiling Surbi smiling is a, it seems to be a general problem every day Surbi is smiling okay no, 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 you don't have a smiley face. You are smiling. You are being made to smile. No, no, if I see one minute, if I see anybody smiling, laughing, anything, okay. No, not a question of doing anything. I don't want to see anybody distracted by this and that. Okay. You no, know, you are not distracted. I'm talking about Hardik and Surbi. Hardik is showing us something and she is smiling. Okay. I don't know what the... This is a say, standard problem. Whoever is sitting next to Surbi is distracting her. I think yes, the other day there was somebody else. So Surbi is very easily distracted. Okay. That we can see. One minute. Okay, guys. One sec. We are studying something very important. I want to finish this off right now. Okay. Don't, uh, don't create problems. Okay. I don't want anybody distracting me. Okay. All right. Are you following so far what has been done? The market through its own process of price discovery sets another sets a price of options. The market through its own process of price discovery setting a price of options. I am sitting in my ivory tower and using my OVM and setting one price of options. I am saying that the fair value of this option should be, this $100 option should be uh, this 4.33 or whatever I used to get, uh, what I was getting from a 35 input. I entered because my view was that the ball forecast, the correct ball forecast for the next 30 days actually is 35%. That was my view. That's a subjective assessment of the ball. Okay. But that's too high compared to the market price. So if I want to answer this question as to what ball input into my OVM, which is the same OVM that everybody else is using, at what ball input into my OVM will the output be equal to the market price? Is this question clear? Yes. Okay. So this is the second way of looking at eyeball. First, we have looked at eyeball as an indicator of market op of option prices. Eyeballs are rising means options are becoming more expensive. Eyeballs are falling means options are becoming less expensive. Okay. Yes. The second way of looking at eyeball is it's the ball input into the OVM. Okay. Which makes the OVM output, which is the call option price, equal to the market price. Is this clear? Right. So one thing common about the market price, uh, common to the market price and the OVM output is that they are both the same. The OVM output is also the call option price and the market is also trading the call option price. But in theory, these are two separate processes. Your OVM is basically you put in your own inputs as to what you think the wall will be and then you get a fair because remember the OVM is a fair value model. Yes. So according to you, the fair value of the option is Based, should be based on a 35% ball forecast because that's what you think is going to happen. You think that the ball in the future for the next 30 days is going to be 35%. 
that's why you think this is the right input so in uh, so is this point clear what i call is now yes sir. yes saloni is looking very troubled yes <laughs> what is it by by uh, this happening like the uh, quality subjective so this by the right no 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 is it one is that there is a see for a particular option for a particular option is being traded in the market yes. and as a result of trading here you can't ask i mean so just like you can't say why is the market price of facebook equal to 180 this is just the result of all the buying and selling okay this is what it is all right similarly the result of all the buying and selling for that 100 strike option in the market is 4 dollars the market price is 4 dollars but when you use a ovm a fair value model remember which is very different from the market price okay fair value model is trying to give you a normative uh, assessment of what should be the option price here you enter your estimate on the wall which was 35% so remember this is a forward looking estimate okay so therefore based on your 35 input into the wall uh, into the ovm it's giving you an output of 4.33 or whatever it was okay so now you are asking yourself okay one of the questions you can ask yourself okay uh, we know that the main difference in the 4.36 and the market price is because of my ball input into the ovm that's the real problem there's the real controversy in the, uh, that's the source of the problem so at what point at what ball input level will my ovm throw out a price which is exactly equal to the market price which is another way of asking is what if the market were using the ovm if the market were using the ovm then what ball input are they using to arrive at a price of 4 this is clear so mechanically this is what i ball is okay so the other thing that you should understand clearly here is oh, we have okay i'm over by 2 minutes but one more thing you can understand is one minute one second this is your uh, see understand the statement okay that it's a species of input into an ovm and also understand one more thing the way you arrive at this y is equal to a plus bx therefore x is equal to y minus a by b you cannot use this kind of procedure to arrive at the eyeball figure you have to do it the way i did it iteratively put in 31.5 doesn't work put in 31.7 doesn't work put in 31.8 trial and error okay so you have to arrive at it by the trial and error method is this point clear yes, sir. this is something else you have to be clear about okay yes. last question sir. anything else that you know that was arrived that you had to arrive at by this method and could not arrive at algebra yes sir irr okay so you should remember this there's one is the similarity between irr and ivol both have to be arrived at through iterative approximation this is called iterative approximation you cannot arrive at by this y is equal to a plus bx therefore x is equal to y minus a by b that that is called analytical that's an analytic solution yes sir okay so why why x equal to a plus bx is that that learn these two terms okay yes, sir. analytic solution in mathematics versus iterative approximation learn these two terms okay. analytic solution versus iterative approximation okay. irr and eyeball estimation are only possible through iterative approximation clear yes. you have learned it now okay everybody is very unhappy because we are exceeded by 4 minutes i'm sure other faculty also exceed a lot 